From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, you better watch for the sweet. Like them people gonna act there as if you be calling in the streets. Certain days and living. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It is Wake Up War Chant. It's presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. Coming up on today's show, it's Tuesday. Tom Lang, Director of Original Content, EP of the Jeff Cameron Show, joining Corey and I to talk about the Knowles. And Corey and I sharing our takeaways from Monday's press conferences. Wake Up War Chant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. It is Tuesday as well there. It's Tuesday everywhere in this fine world of ours, and it's Trivia Day, Trivia Night have some Coronas and some tacos, play some trivia, hang out with some real cool people, have a real great time over at the corner pocket off Appalachia Parkway in Tallahassee. Um, I need to assemble a team when you're not around here, Corey. Maybe see if I can fly the flag for War Chant, bring home a dub for the good guys. Whatever, man. It's game night. I know it you're is. not going to be there. Right, you don't act like you're going to be You've been invited countless times because I, I always forget it's game night. Because, I mean, you know, I feel like, come on, let's kick that to the curb, man. You're like 40 now. Games. You can't have game nights anymore. Um, yeah. and you're, it's video games, right? Correct. I'm not talking about yeah, we're not playing poker. or taboo playing, or something. Yeah. Well, you know, we're um, all scattered. This is how we keep in touch socially. I know it's it's actually cool. I just wish it was a different night. That's I all too. because I I think we could use you at trivia, but I won't be there. I'll be in Atlanta for uh for for this week. Uh, but yeah, man, quarter pocket. I was there Sunday watching the Browns pick up the big dub over the Falcons. Nice. Um, Stephanie was not happy with that, but what are you gonna do? You can't. You're not gonna go into Atlanta. And beat that team. You 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 gonna try to beat Marcus Mariota? Are you kidding me? All that guy does is win. Warchant.com, the ultimate semel sports source. Hit the thumbs up if you're listening to us on YouTube. We certainly would appreciate it. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well if you are uh, listening to us on YouTube or if you ever watch any YouTube videos. The Warchant Rap, pregame show, postgame show, watch alongs, uh, recruiting chats, all that stuff. You're on there. Subscribe to the YouTube page. You certainly would appreciate it. And you folks on your Apple iOS devices, we, we appreciate it again. Thank you very much. If you use the podcast app on your Apple device, uh, search Wake Up War Channel. You'll see two results. Uh, please subscribe. Download off the one to the right. If you can't, for some reason, if it's giving you trouble, some people have said that it has, don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. We don't want you to not be able to listen to the show, but um, if you're able to, it should be a pretty easy process. Bing, bang, boom. Mm. All right. On Mondays, we speak to the coach. I was in pretty good spirits. I liked his yeah. uh, comportment, Mike Norvell. Uh, and I also spoke to Alex Atkins, Adam Fuller, as well as special teams coordinator, defensive ends coach, John Papuchas. I liked, um, again, I liked his, his comportment, obviously sharing his frustration, talked about how it makes him physically sick when they lose, when they fall short, uh, gut-wrenching loss, uh, you know, kind of good things you might want to hear if you're one of these peaks, uh, folks that want to, wants to see other people in pain along with you, Mike Norvell <laughs> showing that. Uh, I did like you asking him about Jordan Travis and running the ball. Um, I don't know e exactly how much this team needs to change things. We, we speak to Tom later on the program. I thought Tom made a really salient point about the fact that, and I, I guess maybe good teams find ways to win football games when they're not playing their best. Corey, Florida State did not play their best by far, and they didn't win. They played all right enough. I mean, they, they kind of came close, so I don't know if there's any silver lining to that, but... I mean, do, do things need to get jump-started here on the offense to to get things back on the right track as they head to Raleigh to take on, I think, number 14, NC State, 8 o'clock Saturday in Carter-Finley? I like that you just throw hype. Like, I think they're 14th. I think they might be. I, I, in fact, I know they're 14th, okay. Aslan, so I, well, I'm going to go ahead and confirm firm you. that up for you. I saw it on a uh, – because I don't well, – if the Florida State's not in it, why am I going to look at the AP poll? I got you. I'm yeah. right there with you. Um, I think – wasn't Florida State – Actually, can you look it up, Aslan? Because uh, um, I would like to know where Florida State was in the receiving boats area. Of oh, the AP or the coaches? Both, baby. Okay. Both. We got time. We're gonna right. we're gonna marinate on this one while I answer this question. But going back to the Jordan Travis um, question, I asked is, you know, look, man. I, other than what are they gonna do about kicker? The question I've gotten the most since Saturday, and look, it, it, this is how it always is after a loss. When it's a win, everybody's fine. But after a loss, people are going to complain. And you're going to point to things and be like, why, why isn't that working? Why isn't that working? And, and other than what are they going to do with kicker, the, the question I got asked the most was, are they ever going to run Jordan Travis? Does he just not run anymore? All of a sudden, he's Dan Marino. He's just sitting back there picking teams apart. Like, that is a part of who he is. And last year, I looked it up, Aslan. This won't surprise you probably. 
But in the first five games that Jordan Travis played, played a, a good percentage of snaps. I'm not counting the Jacksonville State game. He ran for 314 yards in good. five games, which is an average of right at 63 yards per game. This year through five games, you know how many rushing yards Jordan Travis has? 53. 50. Mm. My man is averaging 10 rushing yards per game, which is less than – Name somebody. I don't know. It's about the same as Rodemaker. It's 50 yards more than Rodemaker. Uh, that, to me, is crazy. And not crazy because they've are you, been winning. Are you they factor, haven't needed yeah. it. Are you factoring all into, is he throwing for more yards? I mean, is that, oh, absolutely. Or, yeah, okay. he's accounting for more offense. And okay. they are a better offense than they were last year. But, man, third and six, third and four, first and ten. Getting your and I think as in in it's not even just the Wake Forest game. You could have used some dynamic plays out of him with his legs in the Wake Forest game, sure. But there were other mistakes that happened. I thought his best play, like we talked about yesterday, was him using his legs to escape pressure to roll out to his left and hit Pokey for a big gain. But then they got called for a hold that didn't count. Hmm. Um, but and they also called that play that he fumbled. It was not a broken play, although it kind of looked like it. It was a counter, a quarterback counter run. So they did call something for Jordan Travis, and he fumbled the ball. So they're like, okay, well, let's maybe not do that anymore. Um, Wake Forest just read that really well by – they just diagnosed the tar out of that. It's not like Florida State's called that a lot this year either. And that linebacker just went downhill like he knew exactly what was happening. That was crazy. Um, and the defensive lineman too. They just knew where what was happening. Um, but you're about to play to one good defense, very good defense, and another elite defense. And you need all hands on deck, man. You need every weapon available. And if Jordan Travis is healthy enough to run, which maybe is an if, I mean, he, you know, he, he hasn't shown the running that, but this was even before his injury. Like he ran for 20 yards against, you know, LSU. He didn't do anything against Duquesne. Like, so I don't know if it's just not part of what they are, but I would, I would mandate that on two of the runs in the first quarter, he pulls the ball and goes just to change, to open it up for your running backs. Like, you're wondering why you can't run on Wake Forest? It might be because they know your quarterback's not going to keep it. He's not a factor at all anymore. Um, and so that's why I asked Mike, Mike Norvell that question. Like, you know, I didn't bring up the stats. I mean, he's, he's averaging, you know, 50 yards less rushing per game. It's not that. Um, but, you know, is that is that something they foresee being just what they are now, or are they going to unleash that more? And he basically said what you'd think he'd say, because why would he tell me? It's so kind of a dumb question when you think about it. I did want to get it on record that Jordan Travis isn't running anymore. Right. But what's he going to say? Well, yeah, actually, Corey, we got about 12 or 14 scripted runs that we're going to unleash this week. Watch this. He wouldn't tell us anyway. But I don't you just think that that's got to be a little bit part of the game plan against these two defenses in particular? To have You've got to get him outside the pocket. You've got to use his athleticism because, look, he is a dynamic athlete. He is a Malik Cunningham-esque athlete when he's healthy. He's also throwing the ball great. So wouldn't it be great if you married those two? It doesn't have to be all of one or all of the other. If you could marry those two and use that athleticism out on the edge, bust some big runs from your quarterback, I think it makes a good offense a great offense. And you are going to have to be great to really have any chance in either one of these games. You are going to have to play great on offense, and your playmakers are going to have to go make plays. Jordan Travis is a playmaker. Now, you want him to do most of it with his right arm and his brain. I got it, and he's done great in that regard. But sometimes plays break down, man. <laughs> sometimes your tackles can't block the defensive ends. And when that happens, maybe you can slow down their pass rush, make them a little less, you know, balls to the wall coming off the edge if they think there's going to be an alley where a quarterback can escape for a 25-yard run. No, I think that's fair. I mean – you know, I think LSU did not want to lose to his legs, so he's like, all right, man, I'll take what you give me. Uh, I think teams are now, after the Boston College game, are going to be like, all right, man, you're a legit quarterback. We're going to respect it. And now it's probably the onus is now on him to make them, remind them, because that was the, the funny sort of quip that Norvell had with you. He was like, hey, like, you know, it's not a secret that Jordan can run. Like, everybody knows right. But I don't. I don't think Wake Forest. I mean, to your point, no, these man, teams. Did it look like they? Yeah. It didn't look like that defensive end stayed home very often on the on the read. Um, it looked like they were. You know, there was. They, they didn't have guys off to the quarterback side on most of those runs. They were sending everybody towards the running back. It looked a lot like, frankly, when EJ ran the thing, like he, EJ would never keep it, and so it was pointless to even do it. Like they they knew where it was going. I you know, I mean, I think Jordan Travis has. 
how many rushes, like not, and I'm not talking about sacks, but actual rushing attempts do you think he has this season? Nine? Yeah, I that would take the under on that almost. I mean, yeah, I, I, I can't even recall him like on a on a read option, like keeping it himself. I mean, I know the scrambles, but the, you're not asking for scrambles. He um, had one down by the in the, um, maybe it was the what game was it? Maybe it was the LSU game where he got a first down on like a third and two when he kept it and ran around right edge to like the three, um, which was a big. It was only a two or three yard gain, but it got them a first down. He kept it there. Um, and he had a 25 yarder against LSU that looked like a design run, but man, they they're not. It's not a lot of him and his legs. And look, if he's if he can't go, if he can't do it, that's a whole different conversation. If his knee's not good enough, um, but man, that's just I I I I don't know how you were going to get a consistent running game with the way your offensive line matches up with this defense, the defensive lines they're about to face. If the quarterback is in an actual threat running the ball. Doesn't mean you have to you have to run twenty times like they did with Cunningham at Louisville. You don't want to do that. He's throwing the ball too well to do that. But I wouldn't mind eight, eight for thirty five. Who cares? Like six six rushes for three yards and then one for twenty two. That's enough to keep a defense honest. Where all of a sudden maybe Trey Sean Ward is busting a seventy one yard around right edge because they've they're paying attention to the quarterback. So that's why I asked the question. That was all. Well said, Corey. Tuesdays with Tom coming up, but first. It's winning season over at MyBookie because it's football season, although I argue it's really not truly football season until we start getting some football on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So I don't, I don't know what the Mac is doing, but they're not fulfilling their end of the bargain. Get some games going on so we have some in the watch and some of them put some money on over at MyBookie.ag. And when you use that promo code WARCHANT, your first deposit will be instantly matched dollar for dollar up to one thousand dollars. So what you're waiting for? You know winners. You know what games. You know you know the result before it's going to happen. You know more than I do. Uh, so go ahead and let me know what you're picking. I'll share it to all of our fans here. Right now, Florida State three point dog against North Carolina State, which is pretty much a pick 'em, right, Corey? Because that's the way it works. If it's if you're a home team, you kind of default with three points. Isn't that how it goes? Yeah, I mean, you get usually. I think they say that it's like three to four points for a home team. But cert, I guess certain environments would be worth more. But yeah, they usually. Um, if so, that basically mean they're. If it was a neutral site game, it would probably be even. But since it's at NC State, it's NC State minus three. All right, fifty-two is the over/under. Not sure what I'd want to see on the over/under on that. I I think that bodes well though for the Knolls. If the folks in the desert think that it's only a three-point game, uh, I'd like the the, the, the bounce back. The bounce back going to be strong from the Knowles, hopefully. So check out my bookie. All the games, everything you could possibly want to bet on is available over there. Use that promo code WARCHANT. And again, your first deposit will be matched dollar for dollar up to 1000 Check it out, mybookie.ag. Calendar turns to October. Days turn to Tuesday. We turn to Tom Lang, director of original content for WARCHANT.com, as well as the executive producer of the Jeff Cameron Show, uh, which you won't hear 1 to 3 o'clock today because it's Tuesday and it's headlines. So, uh, But check them out Monday, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. Pre-game shows, watch-alongs, post-game shows. If you like Tom Lang, we got a website Ooh. called warchant.com, and you can hang out with him all the time. How are you, Tom? I'm doing well. I'm so sorry for the people that don't like me because, <laughs> I mean, they're going elsewhere, man. I apologize in advance, guys. <laughs> yeah, you're in their face. Like Lang again, Lang again, especially on Saturday, man. You work harder than Norvell on Saturday. You are doing a lot of stuff on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. It's fun, though. I, okay, I like good, it. man. Good. Yeah. Even in a loss. Both of you guys. How was it, by the way? I wanted to ask you guys. It's the first loss you've experienced. I know, Aslan, you do the first half of the watch along. Tom, you do the second half. But when you took over, it was basically 28 to 7. Mm -hmm. So what was the mood in the chat? What was D-Rob's mood? How did you guys uh, attack that? Okay, so at that point, I ignore the chat. Uh, I, I'll be honest. We've got a producer. His name's Ben. He does a good job. I tell Ben, if there's something interesting, go ahead, because I'm sure it says fire everybody, and that's just what's scrolling up and down the ticker at 28 to 7, so I'm not going to deal with that. But then I just I, I looked to – this is where D-Rob is, is an excellent person to work with because he's so level-headed. And so I'm like, talk to me, D-Rob. And he'll play part counselor and then part analyst. And – what he talked about was that he, he thought the defense did a really good job of putting him, themselves in position to get off the field throughout that 28 to seven run. It's just, they didn't have the players or didn't make the plays to actually get off the field, but they were putting themselves in a good spot. And then it parlayed itself into only giving up three more points before the game was over. So that was, it was an interesting experience. And for about five minutes there, Corey, it felt like we could dare to dream. 
Yeah. But then Greedy Vance had the ball go through his hands mm. and you mm. know the rest of it. Do you guys ever throw in like a tweet of Ira or mine during a game and throw that on the uh, on the on the chat? Oh no, that's a good good idea though. I feel like I could get you and D Rob talking a little bit, both of you, with some of my uh, my witticisms. Um, I or so like I the 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 only real insight I even tried to give in that in that game on Twitter, other than being just you know a smart aleck for the most part, is that first drive of the second half for the defense was abysmal. That was 2020 version. It was early 2021 version. It just stuck out like a sore thumb because it didn't look like they were. I mean, we talked about how D Rob talked about how it was hard to get them off the field or they got themselves in a position to get off the field. Not that first drive of the second half, man. They didn't even face yep. a third down. They just went right through them. Yep. Did you notice that too? Because mm -hmm. for an instant, it's almost like that missed field goal before the half deflated them to the point where they were going to give up. It looked like they'd given up, which is crazy because that's not what Norvell's teams do, and they didn't. They did fight back and give themselves a chance. But, man, that first drive really stuck out to me. Yeah, so I was watching, um, you know, quietly uh, for the first half, and, and I noticed towards the end of the half that the body language had started to shift a little bit from the defensive players where, you know, the hands were to the sky or pointing at each other and stuff like that. After the play was over, nothing crazy like 2020 or 2019 during a play. Um, but – when that first drive did happen in the second half, I thought, uh-oh, because whatever the explanation is for this, it ain't good. It could possibly be what the coaches told them to adjust to isn't going to work. They don't know what they're looking at. Uh, but then also the body language of the players, it they looked like they were. it was a wrap. It really did. Um, they were – the linebackers and the safety specifically looked like they wanted to kill each other. I mean, it was it was interesting. But then this group, man, it's just crazy. That to me felt like 28 to 7 is as good as it's going to be for the rest of the day. Next thing you know, they go down, they score, and whatever conversation was had between that drive and the next one, I don't know who started the conversation, but they deserve either more NIL money or they deserve more money uh, as a you know an assistant coach or a coordinator because that message worked from that point on. I know people don't like podcasts being reactionary, uh, but I'm here, everybody. So, you know, I totally recalibrated my expectations after the, the first four weeks of the season. It just seemed like Florida State had an elite quarterback. Man, I just thought Jordan Travis looked so sharp, looked so on on time with everything he was doing. And the defense was good enough, and I and probably underplayed losing Fabian, losing Jared first. That's going to catch up to you. We saw it catch up to us uh, here this past weekend. What, though, if anything has changed maybe with you, Tom, are you more concerned maybe now about the offensive line maybe having some issues as we face some tougher front fours and, and front sevens? Or as the, did the defense regress slightly or is the injury showing their face a little bit more on that side of things that might have you a little bit more concerned than you were, you know, seven days ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this game was a good sobering reminder that personnel-wise you're not where you need to be. But I'm conflicted about this game, guys, because, you know, on the one hand, you see that the defensive backs in the first half, for example, third and longs or, or second and longs, they're just getting beat one on one. And if it's Omari Cooper or Renardo or Jerry on Jones, it really didn't matter if, if there was a chance to make a play one on one. It wasn't even close. It was pitch and catch. Uh, and then, of course, there was a touchdown. Renardo was in great position, but I'm talking about those plays to establish the drives. And I'm thinking they just don't have the horses. And then you see, obviously, that they're dinged up in the interior of the defensive line beyond Fabian not playing. They're not healthy up the middle. So they're getting gashed up the gut. And you're like, man, they don't have the guys there. And then at linebacker, when the third linebacker comes on the field, whoever it is, you see the drop off from Bethune and Deloach to that third linebacker. And you think, Man, they're just not quite there. But I'm conflicted because all of those things said, offensive tackles were a huge problem in this game as well. If they make a few more plays and a few uh, less stupid mistakes, they might actually outright win the game. So, I, And Wake Forest is definitely a good football team. So, again, you know, Aslan, I think the answer to this, but you guys, I mean, feel free to weigh in, is, yeah, I, I could see that they need better players. They need more good players to fill out their two deep as well. But then they're also, even with all that said, there's something to them that they could still have won a football game against the top 15 team, despite those circumstances. Yeah, and I, you know, I was really disappointed for a large stretch in, with, with the offense um, because that is the first time that that I thought that offensive line just kind of looked overwhelmed at times. And we talked to Alex Atkins on Monday. Um, he talked a lot about um, what he dictating versus reacting. Like he wants to be dictating terms, not reacting to other people. 
And, he, you know, his point was, look, the, the, the worst athletes on the field are offensive linemen. He's not talking about just his team specifically. He's talking about football. And it's clear. I mean, there's 320-pound guys. If they take a half a second to think about where they should go or what they should do to react to something, the play's over and your quarterback's fumbling. They have to be, they have to know what they're doing and be prepared to see what they're going to see throughout the week. And he he kept kind of coming back and blaming himself and saying, I've got to prepare these guys better for that. And you hope it's a one-off, but then man, look who you're playing this week and next week. Like it's not going to be a one-off because these two, even if you prepare perfectly and you know exactly what you're supposed to be doing and there are zero missed assignments, as in, I don't know who to block, you're still going to get whipped up front a good bit because they have really good players on the defensive line, both of them. That's not a missed assignment. That's just getting beat. And that's going to happen because they're better. They have good defensive linemen. NC State does. And then Clemson has maybe the best line in the country. So that's why I was so disappointed about this week because this is the week your offense should have shined one last time before you go into the muck and the mud of trying to push these 300-pound uh, monsters around on NC State and Clemson's defense. Um, so, yeah, I know we lament the defense, and we talked about this on the show yesterday. Uh, the offense is the reason they lost that game. Now, it's all it's complimentary football. We can say, you know, if the defense makes one more play, if they could get off the field ever, the offense gets more chances to score, and they have more than 10 possessions. But, you know, to have 10 possessions against Wake Forest and only score on three of them, that's not good. You're not going, nobody in the country is going to beat Wake Forest scoring on 30% of their offensive possessions. It just can't happen. And that's why I hope it was a blip. I don't expect them to go put up 40 on NC State, but they have to play better. They have to be better on third down, have to be better, well, they have to be better on all the downs. And they're going to have to put up, man, I don't know, 30 points. They're going to have to find a way to score 30 points to win this game. That's easier said than done, though, if their offensive line is not going to be able to dictate things, though. I mean, yes. that's, that's my concern. I, and I don't know, though, Tom, is, is there something that allowed them? Is it Robert Scott's presence alone that kind of maybe helped them conceal some of these things against, you know, relatively athletic front seven, front four against Louisville, and then obviously what LSU had? Because they never looked outmatched. They weren't tripping over themselves. There weren't these huge tack for losses that were piling up. I mean, that's that's what concerns. I just think, you know, maybe NC State with the 3-3-5 three, three, they run won't be as uh, problematic. But obviously, I mean, Clemson, you know, Clemson's going to scare us a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it could be more problematic because one thing Wake did, and I had the breakdown of this on the site last week, they do a lot of pre-snap shifting of the defensive line to try and confuse who you're supposed to be blocking. Yeah. And and I had seen that in practice the, the two weeks leading up to the game, you know, and it's it's not something that only Wake does. But Atkins going through situations with the offensive lineman and saying, all right, if this happens now, what do you do? If this happens now, what do you do? And the combo drills that they, that they work when it's just the trench guys only and the scout teams out there. My guess from the way he addressed the media today, Corey and Aslan, you guys were in the room, is I think he's – basically telling everybody that I miscalculated. I thought we were beyond a certain point when it comes to the knowledge of, of where you need to be and who you need to block. And, and are you talking about Atkins? You're talking about Atkins here, right? Yes. I'm talking about and, Atkins. Yeah. 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 I, I think what, what he's conceding in, in that press conference is that I thought that they could handle uh, the advanced course and we might have to go basic a little bit. So what I would expect to see is, is this week against NC state for lack of a better term, a simpler game plan, so there's less for them to think about in terms of assignments. That doesn't always work. And again, you made a good point, Corey, that this is a really good front, so it might not matter. Uh, but I, it sounds like they're going to simplify things and make it easier for these guys in, in the week to come. My number one concern for the NC State game, though, is you know their offense hasn't been terribly dynamic this year, but every opponent for Florida State until Fabian Lovett comes back should just run the ball up the gut and see if Florida State's got what it takes to stop them. Uh, at this point. So we'll see what happens this weekend, but I mean, this is a concerning matchup for sure. Yeah, I think Ira was saying that uh, he heard that they might have miscalculated. I think Kobe Turner, zero for them, that transfer out of Richmond. Like they, they didn't think maybe he'd be that quick, and he obviously uh, created a lot of havoc. Uh, last thing for me, uh, Tom, just, you know, we'll see them practice here on Tuesday and then Wednesday. You're always out there covering practice as well. Um, you know, huge stretch right here of Wake Forest, NC State. Clemson, I think Wake, I think NC State's still top fifteen. I think they're fourteenth right now. So, you know, if they can win one of these next two, everything is fine. Uh, by and large, I would think. But just how crucial is this coming week? Um, or is I mean, is is it? Are we going to maybe put too much stock into it, or will we finally see maybe culture take hold if they're able to to bounce back and kind of steady things here and, and keep their head level this week? Yeah, what I'll be interested in, and and you know. 
disagree with me if you guys don't believe it to be true. But the way I took in practice last week, and I was there Tuesday and not Wednesday, but I talked to you guys and, and uh, Ira about what you guys saw on Wednesday. It just felt a little flat. Like, yeah. it wasn't that practice was terrible. And Mike remarked on it, but, I mean, I, I felt that too. It just felt, uh, like, okay. It wasn't as dialed in as I remember that that first practice the week of LSU. I was like, whoa, hmm. these guys are coming to prepare today. There was a little jump in their step, and I think they were, you know, camp is over, so that makes a lot of common sense. But what I found, at least through the first five games, is what we see on Tuesday and Wednesday gives us a pretty good indicator of how they're going to play because they've been pretty sharp leading up to these other games against power five teams. And it, it made its way onto the field where you saw, man, that there are great sequences for both sides of the ball. And it just didn't feel that way last week. So I'm excited to get out there this morning on Tuesday morning to see how intense practice is. I fully expect that this is going to be a week where we walk out of it saying they look a lot sharper. Does that mean that they're going to win? No, but I just, I expect to see a little bit more urgency in their steps this week. Let me jump in here real quick, though, Corey. I, I agree with that, man. I think Tuesday, Jordan missed throws that I hadn't seen him miss in practice. And then the whole goofy soundtrack that was playing that day it was just a really weird day. I mean, they're, they're playing Toto by Africa. I mean, and one of the coaches, Larry, stops, yells up at the perch up there in the IPF. It's like, what are you doing? Like, turn this bleep off. Um, it was, And I think, again, I don't want to make excuses for them. And I asked Jordan after the game, and he, he brushed it off. But I think not having any students around, campus being closed, just made the entire week feel really weird for them. Uh, and I don't think they had the same kind of urgency. But I, I I trust, again, man, the way they respond in the second half, I think they'll respond that way in practice these next two days that we can at least see. And I, I fully expect them to be ready to go against NC State. But this was a game that I didn't have a lot of confidence going into this season. And I, yeah, well, yeah, go, going to NC State kind of, uh, you know, in August, and it might still be looking at it now, this might be the toughest game you have left. Um, and look, that doesn't mean you can't lose a bunch down the stretch. I don't think they are, but they're, they're all losable. But this to me at NC State, especially NC State coming off a loss where they're probably mad because they didn't play all that well. Um, they got the kid, the, the slot receiver that I, I would put his over under on catches at a 13. 17 Stop. against Florida. I mean, I, they are going to go. That's all he throws to is that kid. Um, and he his eyes light up when he sees Florida State. Um, you know, Florida State, like Tom alluded to, I, I just don't know, that w especially with the other guys in the interior banged up. You, Fabian Lovett is a difference maker, man. He is a guy that you don't have anywhere else on your roster. It's not like you can say, oh, Malik McLean's hurt, put in Portier, put in Williamson. There are no other Fabian Lovett's. That's clear. And if he's not back, Tom's right because, man, I, and they, they have a good quarterback. He hasn't played well this year. Their offense in general hasn't played well this year. But every offense is going to play well when you run for, if you can run just straight up the middle. And the biggest concern after that weight game, and I know it's a goofy offense, it's almost like playing the triple option. Like you almost have to scrap how you look against it because you're not going to see it again. But you are going to see teams try to run up the middle again. And that was what uh, Louisville did it. Uh, Boston College couldn't do anything. They didn't. Even, they, Boston College just wanted to get out of the stadium. Yeah. But Wake did it too. And if NC State can do it, if there's no improvement there at all, or no fresher or better bodies that are playing in that interior, um, it's you. You, you wonder how you're going to get enough stops to win that game because they will stop you. Their defense is good. It's a tough place to play. So you have to figure out to get some stops. But maybe zero will play, and we'll all be happy because. Man, Jared Verse is a difference maker. It's a whole different team when he was on the field. So you get Fabian Lovett back. That's what's, again, that's what's so frustrating, but it's football, right? People get injured. It happens all across the country, every team in the conference. If you have Fabian Lovett and Jared Verse fully healthy for that Wake Forest game, in my opinion, you're 5-0 and and you're 14th in the country. I, I, I just think that. And if I knew they were going to be healthy for these next two games, I think for sure you win one of them. Hmm. I just think for sure. But without, without Fabian Lovett in the middle, that is just such a... Um, the the disparity, like we've said, the disparity between him and his backup is maybe the biggest disparity on the team, and that's you know that's a that's a bummer. Crazy thing is Wake ran for 171 yards, which is like wow, uh, that's a lot. 3.4 yards per rush, 4.3 if you take out the sacks. So I mean, not you know, I mean they did get some, they popped off some, but it wasn't you know terrible. But wouldn't you have thought if number one there weren't a ton of possessions? It was such a weird right. game. But if you'd right. have thought you held Hartman to. If, Hey, yeah. 230 yards passing, you're like, yeah. well, they're going to win comfortably. But no, not when you give up 170 rushing. That's a lot, man. No. All right, folks. Well, check out all of Tom's original work over at Warchant.com, including Third and Lang and much, much more. And he'll be uh, helming 
things with Jeff on the Jeff Cameron Show Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Thanks the for hanging Mets out are still on in it, Tom. By the way, the Mets, oh, yeah. as we record this, Talk the Mets smack. are still in this. It doesn't feel like it, but they are. And That's look, right, folks, man. it's a 4 and one club with all of these problems that we're talking about. They're still 4 and one so it's yeah. okay. Enjoy the week. Enjoy this week. Is it is it uh, NL East or bust, or can you guys get a – I don't keep all the baseball. Yeah, wild card a possibility? or Yeah, wild card's a lock. They're going to be hosting a okay. few games this weekend. Right. So I get to enjoy Juan Soto grabbing uh, his nether region, hitting home runs. Every time he takes a pitch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah, so how it works, Aslan, it's because – well, it's not official yet as we record this. The Braves just need to win one more game, and they win the division. But the way it works this year for the first year is that first wild card team, the number one wild card team, which will probably be the Mets, gets to host all three games. Oh, okay. They don't have to go on the road. It's a three-game series, the best two out of three, but they host all three. Oh. And then if they win that, they get to go play the Dodgers. Oh. Oh. Go get them, Tom. Go get them, T. Lizzie. I want you to beat the Dodgers. I told you last night I'll be rooting for you guys to beat the Dodgers. It was, you know what? That text meant a lot. I'm not kidding. So, oh, good, man. Well, I'm old, man. I I don't get all <laughs> caught up in this anymore. And, and like, I don't like Mets fans overall. I mean, when you, who could? But I have some friends, some good friends that are Mets fans, and I would like I was rooting for you guys against the Royals. Yep. Like I'm, I and it's been such heartache for Mets fans. Legitimately, I'm not patronizing here. That um, um, and it's, it also helps that I got a World Series in my back pocket, <laughs> fresh one. That like, uh, yeah, man. I, I if the Braves can't win it, I hope the Mets do. But then also screw you. You got the Bucks and the Lightning. So all you do is win. That's right. Well, if the Mets win, I'll never need another thing in my life. Except, of course, Florida State to beat NC State on the road this weekend. <laughs> there you go. That's the big game this weekend, gang. <laughs> That's Tom Lang. Thanks for hanging out, Tom. Appreciate it, man. Always appreciate the at-bats. Talk to you soon. Shout out to Tom Lang again, director of original content for Warchant.com, executive producer of the JCS. That's the Jeff Cameron Show, which you can hear 1 to 3 o'clock daily weekdays here on Warchant TV, as well as 93.3 FM terrestrial radio in Tallahassee, except for Tuesdays, which is Headlines Day. Uh, so you should tune into Headlines with Corey, Jeff, and Ira. Uh, I think Ira might have some knowledge to drop when it comes to kicker. Uh, we did ask plenty of questions to Norvell and John Papuchas on Monday. Didn't get a lot of clarity. Uh, I, I guess maybe the, the only thing didn't to get a lot of uh, he's our kicker either, though. Uh, that's what I was going to kind of say, yeah. right? It's. You know, I, I'm counting on him to go out there and perform well in practice, but it wasn't like, you know, he's going to get this right and we're going to, you know, we're fully invested in him. It was like, yeah, you know, we know he's going to practice really hard and we're excited and we'll evaluate everything. So, yeah, they got Ryan Fitzgerald, uh, Aiden Sherriari, uh, Max Larson. Apparently all these guys will be evaluated during practice. But the, the thing is, and, you know, one of the guys from the other sites asked, and I, I literally was going to ask this, but he, he jumped it, so good for him. But, like, how do you, Corey, how do you evaluate your kickers in practice when, admittedly, Ryan Fitzgerald had a great week last week. We saw it. He made every field goal that we had watched. Mike Norvell confirmed it, said as much on Monday. Like, listen, he made every kick in practice. So how can you evaluate here in practice this week when he did everything you asked him to do last week but then still, when it mattered, wasn't able to to deliver? So how, I mean, do you have to be like, Next man up. It feels like you kind of have to. Yeah, because that, that that's the thing we talked about last week is that it isn't automatic that Ryan Fitzgerald has good practices and looks good. It just isn't. You know, there's there were some kicks in the preseason. There have been some kicks throughout this first month uh, during during weekday practices where you're like, ugh, that didn't look right. That didn't look good. Last week was as good as he's looked. And I think the, the, the hope there, and this is what coaching is, man. This is part of being a coach. It was the same thing with Rodemaker to an extent. If you're seeing good work in practice, you have to – it's not a hope. It's a belief that that will translate to the games. But – so their, their thought was, okay, that's as well as Ryan Fitzgerald's kicked all year. And it was. At least the practice I saw, it was by far the best, ki the best he'd kicked all year. So you thought, okay – he is kicking with confidence, conviction. The ball is booming off his foot. He's fixed something. He's tweaked something. Everything looks good. Hopefully, he goes in the game and just keeps this going. And he was making all his kicks and warm-ups, or at least most of them. And then he goes in the game and, you know, shanks a 29-yarder or pooches it off to the side um, and then doesn't hit the 55-yarder either. He's still kicking the ball and kickoffs well. Yeah. But so now, now you're left to – now it's, it's basically told you practice with him does not matter. You can't 
Until he does it, that was my point with Rodemaker. Until he does it in a game, nothing he does in practice will matter. It just won't. It's not the same thing. He need, He's four of nine with a long of 30. It's it's not been good. He he would need to become the kicker they want him to be. He would have to go out in Raleigh on a Saturday night with a rabid crowd and drill a 40-yard field goal that matters. But are you going to keep playing this game of letting him try to go find his confidence? Because in the process, you could start losing more games. Um, so my thought process, if I'm a coach and if I'm Norvell, is I'm not letting him kick anymore. I, I, no, I shouldn't say that. He's not my kicker this week. Um, I, I would he and here's what here's my bigger concern, and I, I mentioned this yesterday. Say he goes out against NC State, they run him out there because it's fourth and twenty, so they have no better option. It's fourth and twenty from the twenty-five. He shanks a forty-two yarder. And then that's the last time you use them. That's that's the final straw where you're like, we got to get the walk, let, just have the walk on go out. Can't be any worse. But you, because you can't bring Ryan Fitzgerald if he has another bad game at NC State, he can't be your kicker for Clemson because then it gets toxic. You don't want your crowd, which is so in love with your football team, to be booing one of its players. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying they should. I don't think you should boo college athletes. Um, even ones with great NIL deals, which I can't imagine Fitzgerald has one. Um, you, you shouldn't be booing them, but it is a reality that will happen. And why do that to that kid? You can't. You have to coach. You just have to coach like that. You have to, you have to manage, um, I don't know, you have to manage emotions. And that kid, if he goes out on, on a Saturday night against Clemson and shanks a 31, he, he would be booed before he even went out there as he's walking to the field. Uh, a running to the to the middle of the field, he'd be booed, and when he missed it, he'd be booed even more. And like you can't do that to that kid. But here's why: here's when you can do that to that kid. Say you play the walk on at NC State. Kid goes zero for two, misses an extra point, shanks one or two. Ugh. Gross. Right. It could happen, but if it does happen, well, you you. Then, On his white horse arrives Ryan Fitzgerald to save exactly. the day. Exactly, he comes in as a savior. Like you've seen the op the other options. This is why we've been sticking with Fitzgerald because our other guys we don't believe in or we don't think can do it. And I'm I'm hoping that doesn't happen. I hope whoever they play goes three for three and they win by thirty points. But that's probably not a reality. But I I think that's the only way at this point, in my opinion, to save Fitzgerald's career or even just the season, even just the month is let somebody else go and do it. Let him take a day off to watch it. And then if it if does not go bad for that, if it goes bad for that walk-on, well, then he should be buoyed in the sense that he's the only choice they really have. And he, and like, okay, I got a, I got a week off. I, I, you know, our kicking game was bad again. That should maybe give him a little confidence that, well, I'm the best we got. So I got to start kicking like it. I don't know. I just, I, I would, I, I, at this point, you, I think you got to give somebody else a chance, mm -hmm. and in the in the long term, it might be best for Fitzgerald to see somebody else get a chance to know that he's the best option you got. Or it's like win win, man. Well, I don't know that that's probably too strong, but the other guy might be good. He yeah. might make some kicks, and if he does, then you got then Fitzgerald's not the kicker. And if he doesn't, well, then you know Fitzgerald's your best bet, and maybe he gets some weird confidence that way. I like it. No, I think, you know, we talked about it on the Monday show. I think that's that's the play right now. You you go with the walk on and then if he's, you know, able to make the field goals then you know, problem solved. And if not, then it's like, OK, kid, Ryan, we need you back, man. Pick us up. And then if he makes a field goal, just it's an incredible, cathartic, redeeming moment. And then you're full steam ahead with him and you're all good to go. So well, also uh, like for a fan base for the team, like the team at this point, yeah, but, I'm not well, worried about the fan. I mean, the, the, the team, man. The team is playing their rear end no, off. They, I just mean they the fan base as far as that Clemson game. You just don't want toxicity in a fan base that's so passionate about their team, this particular team. It can get ugly that way, man. And they've been so great. These fans have been incredible. That crowd Saturday was nuts. The Boston College crowd was inexplicable how good it was. They've been awesome. You don't want to shift... You, you've got to manage stuff like that, man. And you don't want to give a great crowd a reason to boo your team because then it just gets ugly and gross. And you don't want that when, you're, when, when it's a team that everybody really cheers for and loves. 
But here's the flip side, man. Well, it's not even the flip side. It's probably the same side. That I can't imagine if they're in if they're in Raleigh and it's fourth and nine at the twenty and and eighty eight runs out there to kick. The I I think most of the team's gonna be rolling their eyes, man. Like really, again, you're gonna do this. And if he misses it, heaven forbid. There, there's you don't want to lose guys because you keep making you keep riding the wrong guy. So, but the the what I was saying, what my my overarching point here is so. I would give another person a chance. And then if he goes out and doesn't perform well against NC State, the team will understand why you keep running Fitzgerald out there. Like, look, he's he's the guy. I know he's struggling, but he's the guy. And instead of them, like, uh, you, it, it, I don't think you would create any animosity by continuing to run a guy out there that's missing. Give somebody else a chance, and then if they see that he can't do it, then they'll be much more understanding when you keep running 88 out there. Or go for it every time. Speaking of the Clemson game, kickoff was announced on Monday, 7.30. Nice. You like that, Aslan? I loved coming home after the Wake Forest game and being able to watch meaningful football right. and it not being midnight or but, 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. But it's be as a great a, crowd, yeah, I'll be, and it means we can yes. get after it Friday night. Okay, yeah. Right? Yeah, you know me. You know me getting after it on a Friday night over here. Absolutely. But, yeah, for you folks listening to this show, I'm happy for you folks. I yeah. wonder if they – I feel I got a feeling if they beat NC State, I'll be getting some text messages like, "Hey man, uh, you mind if I come up and hang with you, stay with mm, you on?" You know, there you go. Think. So that's good. Yeah, no one's you talking no about one's, the girl in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, her. Uh, we can have <laughs> nice. a, She could bring her dog's ashes. We'll spread them on the on the uh, Wasissa <laughs> River. You know. Uh, so yeah, seven thirty kick for Clemson. That's cool. I don't know if it'll be. We'll, I'll let Jeff uh, follow up with the level of maintain that will need to be kept for that and one. And I man, I am of the opinion, especially like I don't know if Lovett's gonna play this week. I, I would hope you hope, hope, hope that he would be ready for Clemson. You're gonna need him. Verse should be close to hundred percent you'd hope by then. Um but man, I, I almost don't think it matters what happens in this game Saturday. I think that is going to be a great crowd and I think you are going to have a legitimate chance to beat that team for the first time in eight years. Hmm. I think that's the hardest game left on Clemson's schedule. And I think they know it. And it's going to be a really tough game for them. I'm not predicting a win by any stretch, but uh, they have not played a true road game this year. And you can say, well, what about wait, Corey? Well, they got to go up to Boston College this That's weekend. That's true, man. man. The Eagles Clemson. are riding high. I yeah. bet they'll cover Zay Flowers a little bit better than Louisville did. Um, <laughs> but, like, they haven't been in a true road atmosphere this year. That that Wake Forest game was almost a bowl game. There was so much orange I in there. Know, and it's it was a, absurd, man. It's a crazy 40,000 seat stadium anyway so this will be their first like I know DJ's played great but all his big moments have been in Atlanta uh, you know that was a neutral site game against Georgia Tech and it was Georgia Lousy Tech Georgia Tech team. and then it was at Wake which was also basically a neutral site game this will be a um, rabid crowd that has been waiting eight years to beat this team and will no matter what happens on Saturday in my opinion unless it's 50 to 6 no matter what happens on Saturday win or lose I think Florida State fans will be going into that Do into Doe Camel Stadium thinking they can beat Clemson for the first time and probably well in a long, long time. Yeah. And uh, so that's cool, but that's that's not this week, is it, Aslan? That's no. next week. No, that's next week. That is next week. Yeah, I mean, fifteen. I was bracing for a loss. Sixteen. Yeah, bracing for a loss. I came up for that game. I'm like, yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll pull something off. But everything was you know wishing and praying. Um, I mean, heck, even going to 14 when we knew we were going to have Jameis, it was like, uh-oh. But yeah. uh, at that point, we still kind of owned them. So, man, how the years just kind of pass That was us a by. great Sean McGuire versus Deshaun Watson battle. Cole Stout for a little bit. Yeah, Cole Stout right. versus McGuire. But Smag won, baby. That's right. Well, Eddie Goldman helped. But it doesn't matter. Smag won. Smag, Smag's 1-0 and against Deshaun Watson. Well, no, I guess he lost to him the next year, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. So 1-1, one one, that was even. I wish they'd get a rematch, those two. Get the rubber match going on. All right. That's it, then. We made it. Good show from Corey Clark, per usual. I wanted to give a shout-out real quick. I forgot to do this in the last show. And, again, everybody that comes to Corner Pocket, you guys are the best. It's, you're really nice. You're, they're always very nice about this show. Mm. To the point I, I think they're lying. And they just don't want to be rude to me in, in my face, which please always do that. I, I don't want you to ever be rude. So even if you don't like the show, tell me you do. But walking out of the stadium Saturday night, I got it. I got uh, Shane and Michelle, the the people that, that Shane, the 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 very generous, uh, what is he a Bound Society member now? Yeah, man, he's um, uh, he's up there. Let me borrow his parking pass. Ooh. So I was in. I mean, that's right by the Bowden statue, man. That's where the big boys park. Yeah. Um, 
And so that's great. I'm writing up by the stadium. It's great. And as I'm walking to my car, there's a family in the parking spot next to mine. And I think it's, I mean, I know it's a family. They seemed related, but it's like two couples and then a college age son. And they say, oh, that's Corey Clark. And I'm like, how'd you know it was me in the dark? Like, is my, is my, am I hunched that much? Am, am, is my posture that bad that you can identify me from a hundred feet away? And they said, no, they had seen me come back to the car earlier in the day and thought it was me. And then when I came back after the game and they were still there, man, an hour and a half after the game, they're still there tailgating. So, and they good for them. But then they, they, they wanted to take a selfie, which is cool. I, I do that. I do that more than most people listening to this would think. Like, wait, people want to take a picture with you? Yeah. But it happens uh, crazily. Um, so anyway, they wanted to take a selfie, and I'm like, oh, absolutely, sure. And literally, Aslan, every person in the family tried to do it, <laughs> and they couldn't figure it out. Because when you're trying to get six people into a selfie, mm. that's hard to do, man. It's especially hard to do where, you know, you have to hold your finger in a way, and then the guy's finger was in on it. And then uh, the woman was going to take it. And I'm sorry, guys, I don't remember your names. You're very, very polite. And they're from Atlanta, too. But she was going to take it. But the angle she was taking it right in front of me was not great. <clears throat> and then finally, because we got, we got techno kids, right? We got kids that understand technology. The college-age kid came to the rescue and put it on a timer. Set it on a chair and put it on a timer. So we got to take two pictures. Awesome. Yeah, I thought we were not going to get a happy ending. I'm glad we have a happy no, ending. No, we got a happy ending. It took a 12 minutes, but we, we finally got the selfie and everybody everybody was happy. But that's, uh, again, just if you see me and Aslan out, always come up and say hello. Uh, we're nice enough people, and uh, we really do appreciate all the, uh, all the kind things you guys say to us and about us. A uh, shout out to Bubba Kush, uh, who sent me a message. Hey, Aslan, they cut me off on the postgame show. Of course, I love Corey and Ira, uh, but I called you a god on the postgame mm. show. LOL. Give me a shout out on Wake Up. My buddy who turned me on to War Chant will get a kick out of it. You, the man. So there you go, Bubba Kush. You are a god, Aslan. You're built like a god, too. Uh, a Greek one. How about a Persian one? Huh? Well, I got to bring my rivals into it, huh? When do I get a? Uh, yeah, my my bad. When do I get a shirtless pick of you? Is that just never happening? <laughs> I thought it was going to be reciprocal, but I guess not. Dude, I so want to I want to train together like Apollo and Rocky. You and I, you know, we can just run on the beach, frolic around and stuff. Yeah. But you keep pushing me away, man. I'm like, hey, come on, I'm gonna do Orange Theory. I'm gonna get a personal trainer. And your boys at you fit, man, just pumping the iron solo. Just doing man. what you do. I don't think we go the same speeds, buddy. That's all. That's all. And I think you'd be a little intimidating and angry in a gym. I just oh. feel you. I get that vibe. You're not going to want to talk. You're not going to want to joke around. No, You're that's my that's, daggers at me. That's Mercedes Mike. Yeah, I mean, Mercedes Mike comes in, into town and we go lift and he just got his headset on. I try to talk to him like on public transit, like on the Marta when he lived in New York. I couldn't talk to him on the subway just like when we're in public. Unless we're oh. at a bar, it's like just head down. That's cool, man. He sounds like a good dude. <laughs> just can't talk to him. Awesome. So I've gotten along so well for 20-plus right. years. Yeah, exactly. That's how it works. All right, that's a wrap on the show. Seminal headlines coming up 1 to 3 o'clock. Before that, check out warchant.com. We'll have all the updates from practice on Tuesday morning as well as interviews with Coach Norvell and the players that we get. So that's all over the YouTube channel. Check it out. Warchant.com, Ultimate Civil Sports Source. This has been Wake Up Warchant presented by the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. For Corey, I'm Aslan. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great one, everybody.